while we're waiting for yep. folks to come in. Okay. So I went down to Mansfield last well, week. Let me do a quick welcome here. Um, as we're coming in, welcome to the Austin Woods and Waters uh, monthly virtual luncheon. I'm Spence Collins. Um, Kevin, why don't you just take me, me and you on there for now. Um, and uh, we're going to have our guest speaker here come in a little bit. We're going to wait for people to come into the TV uh, live broadcast. And uh, meanwhile, um, Kevin and I are going to chat about hunting and fishing. We're a social club. We are talk about hunting and fishing, and then we go out from month to month uh, in between our monthly luncheons, and we hunt and fish, and we get back together, and then we talk about it some more. So as we're awaiting uh, folks to come in and join our live broadcast here, uh, we are Kevin and I are going to trade a few fishing stories. So, uh, Kevin, I understand you hit Mansfield a few weeks ago. Tell us, uh, tell us about your Port Mansfield fishing trip. Uh, one morning we went out at, uh, I think we got up at 4.15 and uh, got down to our spot. It was still pitch black, got out with our headlights and um, started wade fishing with our topwaters. And I caught my PBTT, personal best topwater trout. So I caught a 23-inch uh, <laughs> trout on a topwater. Um, How big was it? About a thousand yards from the boat into the bait, you know, where we could see it. So. How big was that trout? 23 inches. Nice. So nice. it was good. About uh, calf deep water, and um, we were all catching fish until a boat blew us blew us out. Drove right through the middle of the four of us out there, uh, three of us out there fishing, and. Um, you think You'd think you'd be in Galveston Bay with that kind of story, but uh, no, that's not typical for Lower Laguna. Typically, there's some better manners out on the water than that, but, you know, there's idiots everywhere. Yep, yep. There were quite a few people down there that weekend, so lots of boats on the water. Yeah. Did y'all catch any redfish? Oh, yeah. We cut, uh, we cut our limits of reds and, and trout three days, so. Nice. All top waters, or do you have lots to go to lots of place? No, primarily soft plastics. But early in the mornings, when it was dead calm, we did throw top waters and do did pretty good. So cool. Yeah, as I've been visiting with you, I hadn't been down to Port Mansfield in 19 years. I went in October with a, a few buddies, and including Chef Adam Gonzalez from from Austin and a couple San Antonio buddies, and. We were just going for redfish. We were sight casting to, to redfish, mostly from the boat. Uh, one of the one of our group would jump off and wade for a little bit, but we'd get in that you know calf deep water and um, let the wind blow us and cruise through those flats until the guy up on the tower saw some fish. Then they'd power down and we'd throw at those fish. And it, it could have been better. wasn't horrible fishing that weekend, uh, but that was our formula. Uh, I made them uh, towards the end of the second day. <laughs> I said, I can't go home with just redfish alone. My wife would kill me. I need to have some trout. So Amen. we hit a little bit deeper water in the saucer area and tried to get some trout. And uh, and they weren't biting that, that hour that um, I was trying to get those trout. So <laughs> anyway, yep. And of course, it's deer season. I know a few of my buddies have headed to the deer lease one guy's supposed to have a meeting with tomorrow it canceled no, i'm going deer hunting all right so anyway i hadn't got a chance to go deer hunting and uh, probably will for two or three times uh, over the course of the next couple months as uh, deer season uh, continues and then then lines down you got any deer hunts planned kevin uh i went down to the ranch i manage down by concan and um a couple of weeks ago with Mike Curran, and we got three hogs and two Audad. No, so really? Never, uh, never gotten Audad before. So um, everyone said uh, they're they're not very good eating. I made uh, sweet Italian sausage, or Mike and I made sweet Italian sausage and uh, jalapeno cheese sausage, and it's great. So oh, Okay. Well, save some links for me. I want to try. <laughs> All right. All right. What else should we talk about before uh, we start into our program? Got any other fishing stories? Uh, no plans. I'm I'm doing some house remodeling, so I'm going to be grounded for a little bit. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm doing house remodeling. I'm actually in Corpus Christi. The bay is 
30 feet from me as we speak here, but uh, we've got I've got construction projects going on down here right now, and it's uh, uh, awfully tempting. It's pretty smooth out there on the bay with no wind, and um, uh, I saw a few flights of, of ducks going back and forth, but once you know you get to this point uh, in the season, there's still not too many ducks, and so most of our duck cutting here on the upper Laguna Madre by the causeway uh, happens really after that split uh, in the season. So we'll pick it up from then and start getting after some ducks when they when they kind of get around here. It's a little, little bit limited out of places to the south, meaning Baffin and Land Cut, and places to the north, Port Aransas and um, Francis Pass, they clearly have better ducks than, than where I'm at right here. But nonetheless, always nice to get into the duck line. Need some colder weather. Push yeah. them down. No doubt. All right. Well, I'm going to jump into our program. Why don't you take yourself off and uh, just put me on, and then uh, I'm going to make a few announcements, and then uh, I'll ask for Dave to come in, our guest speaker here. So once again, now we've got uh, plenty of people on to our broadcast uh, here. Thank you. For joining us today, this is the Austin Woods and Waters monthly luncheon. We meet uh, uh, on the first Wednesday of the month, uh, every uh, every month. And we've been going virtual, of course, since the coronavirus uh, hit us. And so I'm sure we got probably another four to six months uh, left of that. Is, uh, I've got news today that Pfizer and the other one of the other drug companies got approval in the UK in order to... Um, uh, have the, the virus uh, vaccine going forth. So anyway, uh, once all that happens, we'll start meeting in person. Typically, we meet at the Ben Hur Shrine Temple off Anderson Lane, Rockwood and, and Anderson Lane uh, up there in North Austin, just right off Mopac. It's a great facility for our group. We have between 50 to 75 sometimes uh, uh, if you're a speaker such of the caliber as uh, Dave Richards is, you get over 100 people. And so uh, anyway, we uh, if you're new to our group and just uh, logging on and not a, a club member, we invite you to join our club. Our uh, webpage is austinwoodsandwaters.org, uh, where you can get a membership. Our memberships are only $75 per year, and um, uh, that gets you uh, access to our club and our hunts mainly. We'll talk about our hunts coming uh, up, and we're in the middle of, of it right now. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're a social club. We like to get together and talk about hunting and fishing in those monthly luncheons. Once we meet back in person, we have a guest speaker that comes. It could be an outdoor photographer. It could be a fishing guide. It could be somebody from Parks and Wildlife. Um, you know, we've we've got a guy that's a falconry guy that once we get back together, he wants to come and bring some of his falconry. Anything to do with outdoors, not anything, but uh, a lot of things to do with outdoors. We have uh, folks that uh, come and speak to us, and they're all uh, top-notch quality quality speakers there. So mainly kind of hunting and fishing guides is, is predominantly what they are. And so we welcome you all to join our group and, and um, uh, you know, talk about hunting and fishing and do it. So um, with that said, uh, I want to go into a few club announcements, uh, and we are in the uh, middle of the hunting season. We have a hunt master, uh, his, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not hunt master, chief warden of hunting. Hunt master is a different position. The chief warden of hunting is Larry Navar, and he's got some hunts coming up. So if you want to join the club or if you're a member of the club and want to join uh, some of these hunts, we have a sandhill crane hunt in Port Lavaca. Uh, coming up in December and then another one in February. We've got some ducks in Columbus area. We have that uh, Holton pheasant hunt, which I think is sold out. That's actually this coming weekend, uh, so I don't think there's any room there. We've got some duck and goose hunting coming up in Amarillo and Lubbock area, and we also have some duck hunting in East Texas you know, twice in January, the 2nd and 3rd, and then the 9th and 10th. And so um, we'll, uh, if you want to go duck hunting and, and goose hunting, uh, please reach out to us, join our club and um, sign up for these hunts. Uh, I'm working on a trip, fishing trip. Last month we had Captain Sally Black of um, uh, Baffin Rod and Gun Club. 
they have uh, uh, blocked out some time for us on the new moon in April, I'm actually a couple of days before the new moon in April. And some information on that's going to be going out to the membership uh, here very, very soon. So if you want to catch a trophy trout, you want to catch that 30 inch trout, that 10 pound trout that we all desire. I'm in the 30 inch club. I'm not in the 10 pound trout club, but maybe one day. Um, then uh, be sure to make a reservation on that fishing trip down to the Bath and Rod and Gun Club in, 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 in April there. Uh, hope to have some other fishing trips coming up as well, but um, uh, we'll see how that goes here in the next few months. Uh, what else do I need to mention? We have a part of our membership. You get a monthly newsletter. It's called the Game Bag. Uh, it's an award-winning uh, letter. It's 12 pages. It's got stories on uh, our members and, and our hunting and fishing expeditions. Uh, we've got something on youth in the December uh, one here. We've got some more uh, about the deer hunting since we're in the middle of deer season. We sometimes have a new member spotlight, new member profile that we um, uh, uh, share with, with those new members. And we also um, have some advertising and member to member type of services in there. So uh, it's a fantastic newsletter. Always look forward to, to getting that. Um, and John Jefferson has done a um, fantastic job at that through the years. And thank you for John. And uh, he's our longest standing uh, member. Uh, our club was founded in 1965. So we're pushing 55 years of um, our club being in existence. So. Uh, that's it for now as far as announcements. Kevin, why don't you go ahead and bring in Dave and I'll start introducing him and asking him a few questions and then um, we can uh, get into to Dave's presentation. So uh, this month we're pleased to have Mr. Dave Richards with uh, Richards Outdoor Photography. Dave does have a day job. Uh, that's with H&G uh, H Marketing. And maybe you can tell us uh, something about that that has to do with the outdoor business as well. So you can maybe touch upon that, Dave. Um, he's got a, a strong relationship uh, with the Hines Ranch south of San Antonio and appears to have uh, access to a few other ranches and does uh, some uh, seminars and uh, on outdoor photography, some stuff that you can uh, participate in. He's going to tell you a little bit about that towards the end of his presentation. He spoke to our group before. So back in 2004, uh, he spoke uh, about his um, uh, being part of his award-winning uh, book called Observing and Evaluating, Evaluating White Tales. From what Mr. Jefferson says, he's the uh, guru in the state of Texas on uh, aging white tails on the hoof there. And so with all that said, Dave, we thank you for joining us once again at the Austin Woods and Waters Club monthly luncheon. It's a different format and uh, pleased to have you and uh, I'll let you take it away. Tell us a little bit about what you do and about your book sure. and about your photography and your ranches sure. and all that good stuff. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be asked to, to come back and uh, yeah, in 2004, Al and I did a presentation on aging, and then a few years after that, I did one on judging with you guys, and then a few years ago, I did one on uh, life lessons learned from whitetails, so when John Jefferson called and said, I want you to come speak, and, and I said, well, at the time, it's perfect, because I've got a, uh, we just updated, observed like, waiting whitetail, a new updated edition was new, uh, neat whitetails, and so uh, that's what I'm going to be presenting today, and as Spence mentioned, I'm a I'm a uh, wear two hats. I've been very very fortunate. I uh, got in the outdoor industry right after college in '85, and have uh, been a manufacturer's rep for several leading companies out there, including Little Bold and Weatherby. And and uh, but I also started photography even before that when I was in uh, a junior high and in college. Realized I could make some money selling images, and and uh, started doing a lot of stuff with magazines in my 20s and 30s and, and uh, so i've been doing the photography thing for a long time as well and they both messed really really well but i've been fortunate uh that both the sporting goods industry and the photography side of the the game that i photograph and all that with the magazine and stuff is, is messed really really well so i'm ready to jump into it if y'all want to get to the load the powerpoint uh dave before we 
before we, uh, where I can be shown before we get time. started, can I move your, something what? happened to your what's that? Something happened to your audio. Um, it sounds like somebody may have gotten onto your network at home and is streaming something, or you got really choppy on your uh, on your audio. Let me check real quick, but uh, there shouldn't be. Let me go check. It's, it came back. Check. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's checking on that. Uh, I failed to mention that during his presentation, either on Facebook or YouTube, the uh, there's some comment section. So we're going to be taking comments through there, um, and I'll be posting on there, playing with you a little bit. Uh, I see Linda Campbell's... Uh, uh, online with us and Colin Parker's online with us. Thank you for joining. If you want to jump in there and say who you are and who and that you're online, that'd be great. We'll have a little banner back and forth uh, on our comments section. But more importantly, if you have a question for Dave uh, through uh, this process, through his presentation, type your question in there. From time to time, I'll come on and, and uh, ask Dave those questions that are posed by our viewers. So, um, Dave, let's see how your, our audio is doing, and um, we'll hopefully jump better? back into yeah, it. Nobody was on anything, so I don't know what happened. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it was weird. Right after Spence went out, you, your your audio went choppy. So, all right, we'll try it. Okay. I'll jump back in if I, if I see it again. Okay. Now we're good. It's an honor to be invited back and get to visit with you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into it because what I'm going to talk to you about is how it all got started uh, with observing evaluating white tails and uh, talk to you about the new updated edition. I'm hoping that some of y'all have been able to get out in the outdoors uh, already this hunting season. I have. Uh, this is the best buck that I've been on so far this year. And this is a native wild South Texas white tail that'll score right in the 190s. Uh, and so uh, he's the best one that I've been able to get on this year so far. This deer is a low fin, it's free range whitetail uh, in the Texas Hill Country, and uh, probably score in the low 160s. And you can look at his body and see that low hanging brisket and that uh, 50 gallon drum looking uh, physique, and realize that deer's at least seven and a half years old, but two stellar. Deer, one from the South Texas, one from the Hill Country. I wanted to share this was an image out of a helicopter I took earlier this year, and uh, I just love this image. Uh, it's got it's all the brush around this deer. He's just surrounded by sea, but he's a big frame eight point that I uh, was able to get in on. And then I wanted to show you this image, and I'm hoping that your screen's big enough because what if you, I wanted you to look and see if you can find a white tail in that image. Understand that there's a helicopter hovering, and we're looking for this deer, uh, and he's he's in there. Uh, I don't know if anybody can do any comments. I won't take a lot of time on it. But if you look at the middle of the screen, uh, just a little bit up from center, there's a, a, a mesquite tree that looks very similar, kind of in the shape of a Christmas tree. And if you look just to the left of it, you're going to see a white shiny, and that's that. That's a deer's antler. That's a buck's antler. And I'll show you this. This is a close-up of that tree, and it's Dave, easier we're, to see the uh, antler, and you can actually see it. We're chopping up again. Um, let's try okay. some. Since you've got your two computers um, connected into the system, let's have you um, let's have you do your audio off the uh, the one that you're doing the presentation, and. Um, so, because I can see your video on the other one, I think maybe because you have two computers on it, the other one's stepping on the other one. So, um, okay. If I remove this one, okay, now start, and you're going to have to unmute your one that you're doing the presentation on. Yeah, I've got them both on there right now, but um, 
if you can unmute your uh, the one you're doing the PowerPoint slide on and just talk through that one and sh and turn off the other one. I think maybe because because you got both of them on there, one of them's wiping out the other one. So I think Spence and I are hearing the same thing. So I think it's coming from your from your network connection there. Yeah, I'm not right, sure. Talk now. It's in a mode. I can't access anything off of it because it's in a mode like I'm playing a slideshow. So I don't have access. And now you so now you sound fine. So <laughs> yeah, because if we shut and it's here, still doing the same. Is it okay? Yeah. Well, let's keep going. We'll try it. Um, Can you hear me all right now? On, we tested this yesterday and tested it this morning, okay. and we didn't experience any of this. So we'll give another try. Keep going. Okay. Anyway, this is the buck that I was I was wanting you to see. He's standing right off to the left of that uh, mesquite tree. These are just a few of the good uh, good bucks that have gotten in some helicopter surveys. Uh, love bucks like this. I put this image in here to show you, though, that uh, he's jumping over a cactus and everything. But I want you to look at his tail pattern, because even after that buck drops his antlers, if you saw him and he made it through the season, you'd be able to easily identify that deer by the tail pattern uh, being really light colored and little white tips on the sides. This is a big eight, uh, you know, wide, love the beating on his antlers. This is a wide 10 point that's leaping over some brush right there. And then I put in one more. This is a great 12 point. Uh, so just wanted to show you that in South Texas and in the hill country this year, even though some areas uh, suffered through some drought things, uh, we, we have had just some tremendous deer that have already come in. And there's a lot of these bucks that are still live on the hoof that hunters are after. Uh, hopefully you're being able to get out there and get after some of them. Uh, this image, uh, you know, I love and enjoy photographing all types of big game. Bears have fascinated me my whole life and, and sheep and all those kind of things. But the truth is, is white tails uh, have always been my favorite. There's something about the wildness of white tailed deer. There's something about the, the availability across the entire country uh, that everybody pursues them. But uh, they've always been my favorite to pursue with a camera. And I'd been doing it for several years and selling images to magazines and everything. Uh, but about 25 years ago, I got a friend uh, contacted me and said that the Hines wanted to talk to me. And so I called little Roy and big Roy and went down and rode around on the ranch for a day with them. And we talked about their deer and we talked about their dogs and we talked about our families and we talked about uh, the good Lord. And that's conversation kind of shaped uh, our relationship over the last 25 years. And, uh, but the one thing that Big Roy asked me that day after we'd spent the day together, he said, Dave, I want you to uh, photograph every deer that you see. What they were trying to do is they were trying to get images of deer as young as possible so they could identify them as a one-year-old or two-year-old to let them live to be six or seven when they would actually have reached their full maximum potential of antler growth. And I told him, I said, I'll be honest with you, magazines aren't paying anything for one and a half and two and a half year old smaller deer uh, and big deer don't like hearing a shutter on a camera go off. And so that's going to be hard, but I will tell you, I'll do the best I can. And he said, that's good enough for me. He said, told me where the key to the camp house was and said, come as often as you can. And I did start doing it. The one thing that was though, is that the Heinz whitetails, they're wild native Texas deer. You have to be on your game. It's a form of hunting with a camera. Uh, you've got to be within that magic zone of, of 20 to 30 yards uh, and every, with the wind has to be right. Your approach has to be right, but you're also trying to capture images. So you need your lighting to be right. And all those things have to have to work. And so I had places that were easier to photograph that had really good deer, but this is a buck was one that I saw on the first morning that I ever sat. 
uh, in a pop-up that I'd set up. And I watched him at about 120 yards come down this hill and walk down a draw. And I didn't get any pictures of him that morning. It took me about two weeks to get him dialed in to get the image that you see right there. And uh, at that point, from the very start, that first morning, I knew I was at a place that was really special. Of course, at that time in the early 90s, up through the, you know, through all the 90s, the Heinz Ranch, their deer were in the top of the deer contest every year. Uh, so I knew I, I, this was a well worth the effort that I was going to be putting into. But the truth was, is that I struggled uh, and got frustrated at times because a lot of what I was seeing in those sits were young bucks, like these two-year-olds. Great potential, uh, but they're not anything that anybody's going to want to buy for a magazine cover or something. But I kept clicking pictures and I kept keeping files and I kept making a history of it. And somewhere in those early years, little Roy contacted me, said, Dave, we've got a two and a half year old. That is a probably the best two and a half year old we've ever seen that we want you to get pictures. And the problem was it was in late January or mid to late January. And I had just gotten dialed in on a really good buck on the other part of the ranch. And, and I, so I, I stayed focused on that deer and it was just for a few days. And then, um, by the time I got done, the feeder had stopped where this buck was and he wasn't around anymore. So I went a whole year before Roy called me, you know, we talked several times, but he called me that next uh, fall and said, Dave, we've seen this deer. He's really gotten even bigger. Uh, this is him at three and a half years old. And I focused on him right from the start. He told me he's a big basic 10 with some kicker points. He's three and a half years old. Uh, I had him published on covers that year and, and, one of the top trophy hunter, Texas trophy hunter magazine, one of the top trophy magazines in the country published him as a three and a half year old as a trophy. Now this is him at six and a half years old. I followed this buck from three and a half to eight and a half. This is his pinnacle year right here. And he is the pinnacle buck of observing and evaluating whitetails of the 21 bucks that I chronicled their life. Uh, he's without a doubt the, the top end deer uh, in the book. This shows his life from three and a half to eight and a half. As you can see, you know, at three and a half, he looks like a young, fit teenage kid. At four and a half, their body fully matures. Uh, and you can see he takes on the, the, the physical characteristics that we talk about looking at uh, as he aged each year, is how his neck grew to his brisket, the fullness of his stomach, the sway in his back, the triangulation of his head, all the things that we talk about. But we also learned a tremendous thing about antlers. His antler shape was the was the same every year from the time he was three and a half and older with those giant beams, uh, basic 10 point. And it's some of his abnormal points like his brow tines were, uh, that came off his brow tines were very similar every year. But if you notice, he has a drop tine at four and a half, none at five and a half. It switched at six and a half to the other side none at seven and a half and it switched again to the other side at eight and a half. So learned a tremendous amount uh, just from watching that specific deer. Uh, I got asked every time that I saw came out of, of, of a blind, uh, what deer did you see? How old was he? And what did he score? So that caused me to ask the hinds a lot of questions. At that time, everybody was interested to just know if a deer was immature, mature or post mature. And most of them's culling uh, or management program was if it's eight or less, shoot it. And they were killing all their one and a half and two and a half year olds is what they were doing for, for the most part. But they wanted to know an individual age because this is the ranch where Big Roy Hines pioneered uh, aging deer on the hoof. And so I started asking them lots of questions. Why do you think he's three and a half? Why do you think he's five and a half? And they would say sometimes it was because of the aging criteria that we have. Sometimes it was because how he reacted with another buck uh, that was in uh, he was in the presence of. And sometimes it's because they knew that deer from previous pictures or uh, observations that from one and a half or two and a half. So we knew exactly what he was. And I, like I said, they also asked me, what did he score? And believe it or not, it actually takes quite a bit of concentration to get good photographs of mature bucks. And so I was really wanting to figure out a way to do something quick to get a, 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 a good score that because somebody, if we said a deer scored a certain thing, somebody might be hunting that deer that week and he might get ground checked. So I had to come up with a way to, to, to do scores quickly. So I came up with 
uh, benchmarks. And then the first one that I had was for a 150 inch buck. And the way it worked was I realized a lot of their mature deer had at least 30 inches of antler. But I also realized if they had real average beams of 21 inches and a real average mass measurements of 16 inches and real average inside spread of 16 inches, they were still 150 inch buck. And if they had 25 inches of antler per side, they could still have those same average measurements and they were 140 inch buck. And if it was 20 inches, so you can see I came up with benchmarks and I could look at a deer's eye compared to this base and get a real good idea if, you know, if he was going to be in that 16 or 18 or 20 inch mass measurement or, you know, where he fit in there, I could really easily look ear tip to ear tip and have my inside spread. So the biggest thing was figuring out beams. If I had 30 inches of tines and I could figure out their beams, I could get you a score really quick on a deer. Deer's bodies uh, are on a roller coaster throughout the year. So when we talk about aging, it's extremely important to understand a lot of different, there's a lot of questions have to be answered. People send a picture of a deer, they're like, how old is he? Well, what time of year was it taken? In the summer, that deer's putting all his energy and growth into his antlers. Well, by the, uh, once he rubs out in the fall, his body will be at its peak. He'll be putting all his nutrition back into his body like this buck is, and then in the rut, he'll run 20, 25% of his weight off. And as you can see in this post rut picture, he looks like a totally different deer. Uh, we also uh, learned through this buck uh, how a deer's home range changes. He would start out on a certain part of the ranch in the early, you know, during the summer months and hanging out with a bachelor group. And then in the early fall in September, he'd move about a mile and a half to two miles to a different area. All this was in his home base but he moved to different parts of that home base and he stayed there until the rut. And when the rut started, he could be this, this ranch is 10 square miles. So he could be eight, nine miles away during the rut chasing a doe and then show back up in that area. By January 15th though, he was right back where he started out in September and that's where he uh, uh, gravitated to. So learned a lot about a deer's change in their home range. Uh, anything that uh, affects a deer's, uh, nutrition is going to affect their antler growth. And so, uh, you know, when you start talking about, uh, you know, rainfall and drought and illness and injury and all those kind of things, they all have a drastic effect on, on a deer's antler growth. And so what we saw in this buck was at six and a half, that, that season leading up to that was extremely dry. And this deer was in great shape and that, ranch, as I said, it's 10,000, over 10,000 acres. And it has, they have uh, access to protein feeders. They don't have them everywhere, but they, they are strategically placed. And so he had free access to that. And this deer took advantage of that. And we believe he really poured on because it was a dry year and he ate a lot of, of uh, protein and he just blew up in his antlers uh, to what the one you see there at six and a half on your far left. At the end of that year, he had been really active during the rut and he was really run down. And then it started raining and it rained and it rained and it rained all the way through the summer. And you look what he did at seven and a half. He really dropped, uh, he really dropped uh, in antler size there at, at seven and a half and, and went down drastically because his body was repairing itself. And so he wasn't putting that nutrition back in. And plus he wasn't eating that high protein. He was laying around eating native brows on a wet year like that. Well, things switched back around again. And at eight and a half, look what he came back as. He has everything. He's got abnormal point split tines. He grew the drop tine again on the, on the right side. Just a magnificent deer. White tails are talking to you all the time. They're talking to each other. And if you learn to understand what they're, how they're talking, they do it mostly with their body. Yes, they can be vocal, but just like this buck, his hair is erected, his ears are back, his head posture is up. He, I can be looking out a tiny little window of a photo blind and I know that another buck is approaching that is of similar age and status uh, as of what he is. Uh, and he believes he's more dominant because his head's up. If he hadn't, his head would be lowered down. So uh, they're talking to you all the time. The other thing that we uh, came to, to observe and, and watch on these deer was their tarsal glands. Their, their, as you can see on this shot, his tarsal gland post rut is all the way across his leg and has 
uh, scalding all the way down the back of his leg. You see that in, in mature bucks, five, six, seven year old deer that are very active during the rut. Their forehead gland also gets darker. Uh, it really starts to turn on for people when they are on a property that has proper age structure. This image I actually took before I ever started photographing on the hinds. This was on a great ranch in the hill country. Uh, this is over 30 years ago. I took this image, uh, it's even longer than that, it, but he's got, there's a one and a half, three and a half and a six and a half year old. And I explained to people when they asked me about, can you age deer? I try to help them understand. So the reason people don't believe it or don't, uh, understand it is because they've never been on a ranch that has good age structure to show the different age groups. But I said, it's just like, they're just like people. People observe people all the time. So I can put a five-year-old and a 13-year-old and a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old and a 40-year-old and a 50-year-old, and they would easily recognize the, the, the breaks in those types of ages. And it's no different with whitetail. The more you observe whitetail, and especially with them together uh, of different ages, it, it all starts clicking. Well, editors started asking me, I would be showing them a picture of one buck and they'd look at it and they'd, and they'd be like, that's a great buck. And I'm like, yeah, he's only four and a half. Let me show you a picture of him at five and when he really peaked at six. And they started saying, how many, how many of these sequences do you have? And I said, I've got several of them. I've been collecting them for years. And so they started telling me, you know, you need to do something with that. And within the same week, I had three friends, Little Roy Hines and Wyman Menzer and Bill Reeves, who was a photo editor at Parks and Wildlife at that time. They said, Dave, you need to put this in a book and you need to do it now. And you ought to ask Al Brothers to do it with you while he's young enough and might still be interested. And uh, I was going to a barbecue at Al's at that time. We were friends. We had never worked on anything together, but we were mutual friends. And, and I, so I put together a book uh, of a lot of agent sequences and behavioral things that I had and some chapter ideas. Went to the barbecue and after the barbecue, Al and I met and I started explaining to him, I said, Al, you know, I've been photographing on the hinds all these years. Uh, I, I've already talked to them. They're willing to share this information, but I really want to share uh, what Big Roy Hines has pioneered about aging deer on the hoof and uh, would like you to be a part of that. And he, if anybody that knows Al, he's just like a kid in a candy shop that's five years old getting ready for Christmas if you start talking about whitetails. He's all over it. And he was all over that. He said, I'd love to. So he said, how much have you written? I said, it's all in the pictures and up here in my head. And he said, well, go home, start writing, write a chapter when you get done, uh, leave space and I'll add in pertinent information as far as biological information. And because I wanted it to be more than just my observations and the Heinz observation, I wanted it to be biologically sound. But I was all over it. And that's been one of the great, we spent a year almost I would write a chapter. He would come to my place. I'd go down to his place. We'd talk about ideas. He'd think of an idea or I'd think of an idea. He's like, you got a picture of that? Let's add it to the book. And so that's uh, how we started working on it. It took us about a year. And then he told me at the end of that time when it was almost finished, he said, QDMA, Quality Deer Management Association, Dave, is interested in publishing this book. And I said, well, I'm interested in talking to them, but I don't really want to give up the rights on it or anything. I've got 25 years of my life and I've got people like the Heinz who've been, I want to make sure that this book is uh, faithful to them and all those kind of things. And, and anyway, I met with QDMA. They said, you don't understand. It's your book. You know, you've got total editorial control. Uh, we'll do it exactly how you want to do it. We just want to help and want it to be the first book that we do. And so, they came to Texas. We sat down and I showed them ideas about how I wanted it laid out. I don't want it to, it to be a coffee table type book with a lot of great information. And they, this is uh, Brian Murphy's the redhead over there with Al typing up a bio for Al and uh, Jay Guthrie uh, is a good friend who passed on. And, uh, but uh, that's him looking over slides, but that was the beginning of, of observing, evaluating whitetails in it. And a few months after that, it was published in 2003. And as I said, it had a heavy emphasis on aging deer on the hoof, on aging deer by behavior, on uh, Judge and Boone and Crockett scores on the hoof. But because of the friendships of Al and, and uh, the relationships that were built, 
we eventually got uh, Brian Murphy to put in a chapter on aging deer by tooth wear and eruption that's in that book. And also we got Dr. Larry Marchington, who is a uh, Top, one of the top professors on deer communication and sensory uh, capabilities to put a, a, his work in there. Uh, and so it really just grew and grew and became a, 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 a really great project. And looking back now, I tell, I share with men's groups and kids groups and, and things how, you know, those early days when I was frustrated about uh, photographing small bucks and chronicling that and everything and, and wondering why I wasn't getting a certain big buck picture for a week or two weeks or however long it took. And I look back now and I realize it was because it takes time. It took time for me to learn how to, to age and judge deer on the hoof. It took time because living life takes time. I was developing relationships with the Hines and with Al and they were developing relationships with me and my family. If you look at the picture on the far right, that's my boys. And they this all started photographing on the hinds before they were born. Uh, but my, they've grown up now. And one's out of college, the other one's still in. And so that was the the uh, uh, thing that I've come to realize is that uh, God had a plan a whole lot bigger than just about white-tailed deer in the relationships that grew out of this and everything. Uh, this is the first deer picture that I ever gave Big Roy Hines. And uh, it's interesting because I literally was not even going to go to that blind that morning. I, I, I was trying to get on that deer, but the, and the wind was right, but I'd been photographing him there in the afternoon because I knew the lighting wasn't exactly right. But I, everything else was good that morning, and I had a good wind, and I just went. And lo and behold, I got one of the best pictures I've ever shot. Uh, cause the light, came, when it came up over those mesquites, it lit him up like a light. I call this image first light and uh, sold a number of images off of it. But, um, uh, the Heinz willingness to be able to share their information, Al and QDMA and all the people that surrounded me and helped me to put this into a book, uh, form. And today it's used by wildlife biologists and hunter ed instructors and guides and so many people. So it's, we're just extremely pleased with how it's being utilized. And that was what our hope and our dream was, is that people would be become better deer managers and they would learn this technique of aging on the hoof. And so there's a, these are just a few of the bucks that uh, are some of the standout deer that were in that first edition. That's a part of the new update edition. So I just want to share this deer. He's 196 inch and four eighths Boone and Crockett. Uh, you not many times you're ever going to look at a 28 inch inside spread on a deer and have long tine links like this deer has. He just has everything that you could ask for one. Uh, Clint Graff is an outfitter buddy that actually, uh, had told me about this deer for two years and, uh, is who helped me be able to get on him and get photographs. But the big thing that was a surprise on this deer was his mass measurements. If you look, they're 19 and 8 and 19 and 5 eighths. It's really unusual for a wide deer to carry those mass measurements all the way out uh, into their beams, into those third and fourth circumference measurements. But just an amazing deer. He was the number one typical in 2002 in the Texas Big Game Awards. <clears throat> this was stickers at eight and a half, uh, 215 and 4 eighths as an old eight and a half year old. His beams were what are extremely stellar about this buck. Uh, they climb, they grow out and back, and then they come all the way forward. He has 29 and 3 eighths and 27 and 3 eighths. And the only reason that one of them is not 29 on there, if you look at that right upper beam, he, he'd, he'd already chipped a piece off of it. He'd have probably had 29 on both sides. Uh, but just again, a stellar whitetail that has everything in the world that you could ask a deer to have. And he was number one typical in 2002 uh, at the Texas Big Game Awards. Uh, this buck is a deer we uh, call Tall Boy, as you can see from those antlers. 204 and 28. He was six and a half years old when a hunter got him uh, for me to actually have the scores on him. And, and uh, he had 50 inches of time length on one side and 48 on the other. But the thing that's fascinating, he is, he only has a 16-inch inside spread. So he has to be phenomenal in every other category, which he made up for that lack of spread in his in his beams and in, in all those extra tine lengths. And this buck, uh, the year he was harvested, he won the Muy Grande, the Las Casadores uh, in 1999. 
This is another great deer. I've, I followed this deer for three years before I ever got a photograph of him. Uh, I would see him really early. I would see him really late. He'd come into my setups, but he was just extremely wary. And uh, literally in the last week of his life, I got on, I was able to get these images of him. It's It was darker than when uh, that than what these images appear. And that's because I I was shooting, this was back in the day when we were shooting slide film. And I this is these are, uh, Fuji Velvia 50 speed slide film. I was shooting off of sandbags, praying it, that one of these shots would come out. He was about four miles from where anybody had ever seen him. And he walked out, turned around and posed. And I shot these images. I had no idea. If you look at the right image in the, it, that he had a, uh, a spider web in his antlers. Uh, some of y'all may recognize that image. Texas Parks and Wildlife ran that as a cover uh, one of their, uh, I believe it was a December issue because of the spider, regardless that he was 193 inch uh, buck. But the other thing was that this buck, uh, his mass measurements, 21 inches. I mean, that is off the charts, super mass measurements per side. Uh, and again, he won several contests that year, the Muy Grande, the year that he was taken and, and, uh, and some of those. So what happened was, is it towards the end of last year, it was running out of copies of the book. We'd reprinted it many, many times over, since it's, it's never been out of print since we produced it originally. But we were running out and it was time to do a, an update. And I had gotten, we'd considered it a couple of times before, but I had gotten enough different aging sequences and judging sequences that we felt it would be worthwhile doing a new updated edition. So this is my wife and I, we were down at Smith Print in San Antonio where they actually did the print, printing on it. Uh, very fortunate in this uh, new updated edition that I've got great friends like David Morris, uh, Bucks of Tecamati, and uh, uh, Brian Murphy with QDMA, Keith Balford with uh, Boone and Crockett Club, Larry Wysoon, uh, Steve Hall, Parks and Wildlife all give their endorsements uh, uh, and very nice uh, words on the back cover. Uh, but that's the new updated edition. And I'm going to share a few of the of the, the deer in this new updated edition and why we added them. This buck was extremely unique. If you look at the far left shot of his coat, the buck standing behind his rear is, he's the normal color of a whitetail at that time of year. This buck was almost white. When he came walking in through the brush, which he lived down in a really wo woody area and he would walk through the woods. I could see him coming. Uh, he looked like a ghost coming through the woods. And uh, we talked to a number of biologists to try and figure out at the time what was going on with him. One, they were wondering, is he going to die? Uh, it, it hadn't affected his antler growth that year. All of them said that it had something to do with a uh, uh, virus. Uh, we believe it had something to do with his blocking the nutrition Whatever it was in his nutrition that would have been given the pigment to his fur was not being broken down or not being utilized. And so he had a different color coat. <clears throat> the next year, he's at six and a half, and you can see his coat had darkened up quite a bit. It sure hadn't affected his antlers at all. That image is by one of my sons, Joe. Uh, I had tried to get on him multiple times that year, and the only image he let me get of him was walking away into the brush uh, one time. Uh, and so I was really thankful that one of my boys got on him that year and Joe got those images. And then the image on the right, you can see his colors even more back to normal. He's seven and a half years old and it sure didn't affect his antlers any at any time in his life. This buck was a super 10 point. Uh, it, I started following him at two and a half. He was just a real pretty basic 10 at that point, but very symmetrical. I thought that's going to be an interesting deer. At three and a half, he got bigger. Uh, and I cover him all year, all the years in the book, but I'm showing you these images because at four and a half, he was again, a, a beautiful 10, but he's got a couple of little abnormal points down on his bases. Sometime at the end of that year, he must've had one heck of a fight because we didn't see him again until the fall when he turned five and a half. And when he walked out of the brush, we were shocked uh, because he had shrunk tremendously in antler size. And he was like a seven by four with some abnormal points. And we were thinking, what on earth? And he wasn't limping. He didn't have anything going on. And all of a sudden, we realized through some of my photographs that he had taken a horn in the side of his neck. You can see it in the middle image right down below his eye. 
that he had taken a horn in his neck and apparently it had gotten up into his jaw uh, area. It had affected his nutrition and affected a lot of things. So he had really not grown out. Well, he was only five and a half. So we watched him that year. And I can't tell you how elated a phone call it was when I got the next fall uh, when Quattro Hines called me and he said, you're not going to believe it. That deer's bigger than he's ever been. And he's a big 10 point again. I didn't even think I was going to get a picture of him that year because they were hunting on him from the start. And uh, the first hunters that they had, nobody got on this deer and they wound up taking a nut, you know, hunting and getting a different deer. And so there was a little window in between some hunting groups and Quattro called and said, there's a window if you want to try and get in there. And by God's grace, I got in there and, and uh, got uh, just a few images of him. Uh, and he's turning back, looking at me right there. And, and you'll see more on, on him here in a minute. But just a phenomenal 10 point. As you saw, he uh, scored 193 and 4.8. So uh, we talk about in the book about when's the best time to take a a, 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 a buck, you know, and and there's all different types of reasoning and answers and all those kind of things. But this buck's a really good example. Uh, he's five and a half years old. The hinds usually wait until seven and a half. Occasionally, if there's a super six and a half, like that 204 I showed you, they'll take them, try and get a hunter on them. This deer, it was just too early for their management program. They want that deer to be spreading his genes. And and uh, he, just, he had so much potential, but he and he was so beautiful. Uh, well, he wound up, we think, got in a fight later that year, and we, they saw him in a helicopter survey, just saw his skull and his bones down on the ground, and we picked up the skull, and that's why I've got measurements on him. So he's actually in the, the measurements, but we talk about it, that it's it's an individual decision. You get a deer that has double drops, there's a lot of things that kill whitetails in the brush, uh, everything from coyotes to fences to any number of things that can uh, include other bucks. And that's probably what uh, caused this deer to make his demise. Thankfully, they were able to find his, his antlers, uh, to at least have his antlers off of him. <clears throat> it had been probably 10 years since stickers had been killed by a hunter. And, and the hinds have had a lot of great deer between that time, but nothing of that big giant frame until this buck came along. And a uh, little Roy called me. I can remember I was riding down the highway. He said, you're going to be really thrilled to, to hear about this buck. He's got a frame as big as Stickers was, but he's super symmetrical. He's a big, beautiful 10 point. Uh, we've only seen him a couple of times, but we think you want to get on him. He's a, he's a five-year-old. And so I camped out and tried to get on this deer. And I got him in post rut in January that year, uh, photographed him from the time he was five until he was eight and a half. I just put a few images of him here uh, and, and to show you his growth over the next couple of years. <clears throat> what I wanted to show you though in this deer is again, when you see a deer with this kind of a frame, how do you judge that that uh, inside spread? He's got a 23 inch inside spread. And you add five inch ear lengths uh, and get your start. And how do you judge those times? You look at that ear and you compare it to that that brow time to that ear and start getting your measurements off of there to realize that he's going to have some 12, 13 inch tines back there. So again, just a phenomenal, another 190 inch deer off the Heinz Ranch. This deer is extremely unique in a lot of different ways. And I again, you get different people. We wanted to have a buck in there and we, we touched on it with different bucks in the original book but we wanted to make an a point to understand that Boone and Crockett score is just that. It's a way to talk about a whitetail's antlers and have some kind of idea as the about the number of inches that he grew. It has nothing to do with the trophy quality of that animal. This animal is in every way a super trophy. He's mature. He's big bodied. He has a thick neck. He's got 12 points. Uh, there's no flies on this deer, and yet there's people that would look at it and he may not have a real high score. He's going to be in the mid 150s, but everything else on that deer makes him one of the most unique and beautiful deer that I've ever photographed. And I really appreciated getting to watch this deer over the years. So we wanted to make that point. If the first time you ever saw this buck was at 100 yards, 150 yards, and you're looking at the picture on the left and he's covered up like that, most hunters would look and look, they would if they're looking for a big giant buck of a lifetime, they'd pass on him and they'd probably pass the best buck they could have ever kill. What they don't realize is his head and his body is so massive. 
uh, that it makes his antlers look small. This deer, uh, his inside spread is only 17 inches, but and his beams are very average, but he has that 30 inches of tine length. So when you look at everything, he's going to score over 150 inches. And, uh, and so I just wanted to show you that deer. And we knew this deer. He was nine years old when, I, when we got these images and a hunter got him that year. Uh, but if you look at his nose, he had a pink nose. So we, they'd been trying to get him since and when he was a lot bigger deer at six and a half and seven and a half and even eight and a half and nobody had ever been able to get on him. Uh, so, uh, but again, you get a big body deer, recalculate those antlers because uh, they're going to fool you every time. This was one of the most symmetrical deer that I've ever photographed from the standpoint of he was a six by six, but even his brow tines make him a 14 point. They're split and they're exactly the same. He's 82 and an eighth and 81 and seven eighths. One of those splits is nine tenths. It's like nine and a half tenths. So it wouldn't score. Otherwise he'd be uh, right at less than an inch. So really symmetrical deer that I talk about. And then this is the Barrett buck that the year that uh, Mark Barrett uh, harvested this deer, he was the Texas state record at 307 and one eighth. And I write up about this deer. So uh, what you'll notice on this deer again, and it, it shocked me when I did it, when I did, figured up the totals and the way we do it in the book is we have time links, we have mass uh, totals and you, uh, you total up every category and then I have a full antler total. And those antler totals on this deer were 142 and one eighth and 143. So he's less than one inch difference between all those abnormal points and all that growth from one side to the other. So we tell people, and there's a lot of examples in the book, if you're in a rush, you're judging a deer, look at one side of the antler, score it. And unless there's something really crazy different, double it and, and you're going to be really close. And, and it held true for even the biggest buck that was ever taken in the state of Texas at that time. And I put this buck in because he's a free ranging, low fence, hill country whitetail. I get asked all the time as the aging criteria that y'all use, does it work for the hill country? Does it work for the panhandle? Does it work for Georgia or Kansas? It does. That if you look at him at five and a half, look how his neck and his brisket look like one same muscle. His stomach sway looks in his back sway and his stomach fullness. All the, the criteria that we look at a five and a half year old shows up on a, on a hill country deer at six and a half. He starts getting a hump on his shoulders and his, neck to brisket is looks like one continuous muscle and you see the ripples in his chest and and uh at seven and a half his body is huge he looks like a 50 gallon drum sitting on toothpicks when he walks he jiggles like an old man so all that criteria is the same there's a two-page spread in the new book uh of these bucks uh in a battle it's the best eye to eye confrontation that I ever uh, photographed. I talk about a buck rolling his eyes and looking you right in the eye uh, or looking who he's going to fight in the eye. Uh, and then this is a two page spread also why we don't use antler size as an aging criteria. We knew fully well when we did the original book that antlers increase in size with the age of deer. You can show it in every picture that we do. This is why we don't use antlers though. This buck, this is stickers at three and a half years old. His, his antlers already had 25 inch beams. He already had over 30 inches of, of, uh, of tines. He already had over 18 inches of mass. They scored 175 inches. So anybody wanted to kill this buck and would have justified killing this buck. But if they had, you'd have never seen a 230 inch deer or a 218 or when they actually killed him. And those genes would have been spread for a few more years on your place. So that's why we don't use uh, antlers as an aging criteria. I wanted to tell you all about a great opportunity. Uh, as I said, I've been a photographer on the Heinz for almost 25 years. And I've, I have been the sole photographer and my sons for almost all that period. There's very few people that have access. I have, uh, the Heinz have opened up the doors and I'm going to be doing a photography workshop with about seven to eight. Uh, photographers, uh, January 14th through the 16th. This is photographing wild whitetails. This is not driving around in a park and, and taking pictures. We're going to try to teach in instructional classes how to get in a blind, how to be in a blind quiet, how to do all the things that you have to do, where to set up your pop-up, all the things that you need to do to be successful at it. 
and put a buck out there in the right light at the right timing. Then we're going to give you opportunities over two and a half days to sit four different times and take a chance at getting a photo of a buck of a lifetime on one of Texas most legendary uh, ranches. I say it's one of the most legendary ranches because it is guys. I mean, they, their deer uh, have appeared. These are just some of the covers over the years on everything from sports of field to uh, most of the Texas hunting publications that you can see out there. Peterson's hunting uh, their deer win contest year after year. This is the property where aging on the hoof was uh, originated from and that observing value what he white tails is based around. So it's an extremely unique opportunity. You can go on my website at richardsoutdoorphotography.com. It takes a thousand dollar deposit to hold a spot and there's a few left is all that's left. Uh, and so I encourage you to sign up if you're interested in that and let other photographers know. Uh, and I also wanted to say that I'll be this Friday at McBride's gun shop with Joe and Butch and all the gang there. And I'll be doing a book signing from two to three 30. So come out. I hope that you'll tell your friends, uh, would love to see y'all and visit about whitetails there and, uh, look forward to seeing a number of you on, on Friday. So if anybody's got any questions, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Thank you, Dave. That was very, very informative for me. Who's not an avid deer hunter. I, I get out two or three times, maybe at the most a year, but, uh, I learned uh, a bunch from you today and, and, uh, can't wait to, to use the knowledge that I've got from you today out in the field at some point here in the future. So a few things here as we kind of wrap up, um, uh, John Jefferson's asked me to, um, uh, have you mention or talk about how the QDMA merged and is now in the National Deer Association? What's what's that all about? Well, and, and I'll tell y'all what I know. Um, the And that is just about exactly what JJ said. And, and that is that QDMA has merged with the National Deer Association. I, you know, I'm, I'm a member of QDMA, a life member, a member of TWA, a number of organizations. But QDMA, because of COVID, uh, earlier in the year, and uh, like a lot of these uh, conservation organizations, uh, were making a lot of changes. And so the best thing for them to do at that time was to join with the National Deer Association and uh, to shore up their two organizations. And they're both good organizations, great organizations that do a lot for whitetail deer. Uh, and so it, it's barely in their infancy stage. So I don't know a whole lot more about it than that. Uh, still has some good friends at QDMA, and I look forward to meeting some of the folks that came from National Deer Association and and knowing more about that in the future. Well, you got to believe it's going to improve uh, both organizations there. So a few other questions I've noted down through your presentation here. Uh, first is, what's the the story on the the Barrett buck? Where was that taken? Who was the the hunter? Uh, what what can you share with us on that uh, Texas state record Barrett buck? Yeah, that was Mark Barrett. Uh, it took that buck on the Las Races Ranch. And so they're down in the Golden Triangle down there, not far from the border. And and uh, I got a call from Marco Barrett that year as a friend of mine. And Marco said, we have got a phenomenal deer uh, that we think uh, is going to score extremely high and really think you'd want to get some pictures of. And so I'm extremely thankfully ran down there and, and uh, went down a couple of times. And as you saw, he's in velvet. Uh, and, and those deer, you know, it was in October when I was photographing that deer and they stay in velvet longer in that part of the world. And so, uh, and so it, his dad, Mark, is actually who harvested the deer. And it was the Texas state record. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I should have put the year that that, that that was the Texas state record. And it lasted for a number of years. I'm not sure about what the Texas state record buck is currently, but that that was the te Texas state record for several years. And it was on the Las Races Ranch. Where um, in, in how long you said 15 years ago, 20 years ago? No, this was, this was, I, I want to say this was probably in the last 10 years. Uh -huh. This was probably, uh, gosh, I, I, I want to say tw 2010 was the time that it framed that he that he took that deer. 
but it was in all the magazines and all the write-ups and everything else that it was the new Texas state record. Awesome. Uh, one of our viewers wants to know where can we get your books other than McBride's at 2 PM on uh, Friday, where you can buy a book and get it signed. Uh, where can we get your book on your website? I'm sure. But is there other sure. places? Yeah, you can, you can, as you said, uh, the, our website has it at richardsoutdoorphotography.com, but you can also Texas Wildlife Association and Quality Deer Management Association. Uh, if you're in Houston, Carter Countries has them. If you're in San Antonio, Dury's Gun Shop has them. Texas Trophy Hunters is running a deal right now. I think if you join as a member, uh, then you, you get a free book, uh, which is a heck of a promotion that they're running right now for a week or so. Uh, if you're there's shops all over Texas and and other parts of the country, but uh, Texas Wildlife Association and QDMA are two other places you can get it online that I know about for sure. And Texas Trophy Hunters. And Friday at McBride's at 2 p.m. Of course. Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Well, good. Uh, Dave, I appreciate your time and your insight and your knowledge and and a uh, fascinating topic, I think, uh, really struck home with uh, our viewers and our members here today. I've gotten some fantastic um, uh, comments in the comments section there. So, uh, well, again, thank you so much for joining uh, the Austin Woods and Waters Club again uh, this month. And uh, hope to have you back probably sometime in the future as well. That'd be awesome. I always enjoy it. Y'all are a great organization. And I love that y'all get out in the woods and do your hunting and fishing. That's great. And talk about it too. Don't forget that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. I'm going to wrap up with a couple of announcements that I left out. Uh, I'm going to take Dave out. So again, thank you, Dave. And uh, then Dave, hold on a little bit before you sign off. I'm going to come back to you, but um, uh, a few more things. One um, is our supporters, our, our uh, corporate sponsors. I always like to mention they, they make our organization go. It's uh, really helpful to both us and the McBride's Foundation, which is our foundation of the Austin Woods and Waters Club, but Plains Capital Bank, Morgan Stanley, Independence Title, Dynamic Systems, Texas Disposal Systems, McBride's, Per Sterling is Wealth Management, and then Representative John Sirier, who got reelected last month and is one of our members in the uh, and has really taken on a leadership position within the, the Texas House of Representatives, uh, namely as the chairman of the Sunset Commission and chairman of the CRT as well. Also want to give special, special thanks to Jack Nash. Hopefully you're listening today, Jack, uh, as he paid a couple of big donations of two deer hunts to our organization and our fundraiser back in October. Oscar Robinson needs uh, some credit, virtual CFO and, and Daryl Neens. And so lastly, but uh, certainly not least, we are at a uh, point in our calendar where we're looking for a few new board members. And so if you'd like to help out the Austin Woods and Waters organization, we'd uh, love to hear from you. Please either reach out in the comments section or call or email me. You can find my contact information on the uh, club website, which is austinwoodsandwaters.org, austinwoodsandwaters.org. Thanks again to Dave and uh, thanks for joining us today. We'll have this on our Facebook Live uh, and of course our YouTube pages so you can share with some friends. Uh, you can come back and, and watch this again. Thank you all, y'all have a good day.